Welcome to the Tobacco Online Policy Seminar Tops. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Jasmine Chan, a public health doctoral student at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Tops is organized by Mike Pesco at the University of Missouri, C. Shang at the Ohio State University, Michael Darden at John Hopkins University, and Jamie Hartman Boyce at University of Massachusetts Amherst. The seminar will be one hour with questions from the moderator and discussant. The audience may pose questions and comments in the Q&A panel, and the moderator will draw from these questions and comments in conversation with the presenter. Please review the guidelines on tobaccopolicy.org for acceptable questions. Please keep the questions professional and related to the research being discussed. Questions that meet the seminar series guidelines will be shared with the presenter afterwards, even if they are not read aloud. Your questions are very much appreciated. This presentation is being video recorded and will be made available along with presentation slides on the TOPS website, tobaccopolicy.org. I'll turn the presentation over to today's moderator, Jamie Hartman Boyce from University of Massachusetts Amherst to introduce our speaker. Today, we kick off our summer 2024 season with a single paper presentation by Dr. Reto Auer entitled Electronic Nicotine Delivery Systems for Smoking Cessation. Dr. Retter Auer, MD, is an associate professor and head of the Substance Use Unit at the Institute of Primary Health Care, BHAM, of the University of Bern. He's also a primary care physician in the city of Bern, Switzerland. He leads a variety of research projects with a focus on randomized controlled trials of smoking cessation interventions, cannabis for non-medical use, colorectal cancer screening, and implementation and dissemination projects promoting participatory medicine in primary care. He trained as an internist physician in Switzerland and was awarded a master's in advanced studies with a focus on implementation and dissemination sciences at the University of California, San Francisco in 2014. Our discussant today is Tracy Smith, an associate professor at the Medical University of South Carolina. Dr. Reto Auer, thank you for presenting for us today. Well, thank you so much for the invitation today, and I will directly start with sharing my screen. I hope you can see that. And uh, for those who don't have the subscription to the New England because it's behind a paywall, you have the link to the last authored um, um, version. So study disclosure, no author has a relationship with the tobacco, vaping, or pharmaceutical industry that would create a conflict of interest of these analysis. The study was funded by an investigating clinical, clinical trial by the Swiss National Science Foundation, Tobacco Prevention Fund, Swiss Cancer Research, and Lunga Zurich. Um, personal conflicts of interest statements, also no payment. Um, the other research is also publicly funded and a member of a federal commission in Switzerland my position don't expressly mean that this is from this commission, but my bias is that I work as a general practitioner. So I do recommend nicotine replacement therapy for smoke cessation and um, uh, in cherishing and making discussion. And if patients don't like benefit from nicotine replacement therapy, I recommend nicotine containing e-cigarettes or now also nicotine pouches to stop smoking. And another personal is I'm an ex-tobacco smoker. I'm an ex-vapor. I'm an occasional nicotine user, and that might create a personal conflict of interest. Uh, but now this, uh, I'm presenting, but as you know, this work is huge. Um, and uh, especially Anna Schoeny from Bern uh, and Audrey Bertet from Lausanne were from the get-go for these last 10 years to prepare this grant and all the other study nurses and the clinicians and colleagues who worked on it. And uh, as the segue to what we're talking about, the approach of extends is really what Steve Schroeder said from UCSF a while ago, hate the smoke club, the smokers. Um, we can have a discourse uh, about the tobacco industry uh, that we don't accept the method to encourage other people to smoke uh, and attack policies against it, but at the same time, don't put that hate and uh, against the smokers and love them. As an ex-smoker, I would like you to do that. <laughs> And also, there's no harm of being sometimes wrong, especially if somebody is um, promptly found out that what we say today might be changed over time, and, and that's fine. So we're trying to do the best here. We're not saying it's the absolute truth. 
but my experience also in this topic was um, also with this sentence and this wonderful article by Hallam Krumholtz, uh, a cardiologist, and a note to my young colleague, be brave. And what we experience in the, in the area of e-cigarettes is amazing and sad. So I never experienced this in tobacco, but the personal attacks we received um, that we were paid by the tobacco industry and others that we were not doing enough for e-cigarettes and and you know in each professional it's a it's a contentious topic um, but really for the young ones here just be brave look at the evidence and then uh, time will will go. Jamie, you <laughs> were contributing to this uh, and it's the Cochrane. We know e-cigarettes. Uh, there's high sensitivity that increase quit rates compared to nicotine replacement therapy. Moderate evidence um, that nicotine containing e-cigarette increase quit rates compared to non-nicotine e-cigarettes. But that sentence is important to understand e uh, extents. Due to issue with risk of bias, there's low sensitivity evidence and compared to behavior support, no support, quit rates may be higher in participant randomized to nicotine e-cigarettes. And there's no way we can change this. Extents is in the third tier. This is an open label trial. We contrast this against usual care. Um, and there is um, this inherent risk of bias due to the design. And probably the, the value of extents is not necessarily in being the hardcore rigorous randomized trial. It is rigorous randomized trial, but the design meant to answer other questions too. And to put also the things a bit in perspective and going back to why we are interested in e-cigarettes, me as a primary care doc working with patients who want to quit smoking, nicotine replacement therapy, I was working with grief because what smokers want, if they like the kick, the nicotine hit of cigarettes is feeling this hit. If you have something going into a lung, it's extremely effective to bring nicotine to your brain. And contrast this with, and I'm sorry it's in German, so you know I'm from the German part of Switzerland, grew up in the French part, but uh, I, I couldn't find a beautiful figure in, 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 um, in English on this. But you have the cigarette that would be the cigarettes, um, and that's uh, in, in, in the veins. It, it goes really quickly in the brain because it goes in the lung. And for the gums, you have this on your gum and it takes some time until it reaches your, your, your veins and then goes to your brain. And usually it's 10 minutes. And if you think about the craving that lasts five minutes, then that people won't have this kick so much. And with patches, it's really lower. Um, the analogy would be Ritalin for the, for the, flask, for the, for the patch. And uh, and and crack cocaine for this for the uh, cigarettes and uh, e-cigarettes are pretty similar to cigarettes. So, and and you don't regulate these things the same, uh, and you don't expect that as many will become addicted to it. Uh, but at the same time, you could help a lot of smokers quit. And the other on it's an awful slide about what really comes out of it. You know, I'm a primary care doc and turn is working with toxicologists. It's really important to understand the difference between e-cigarettes and conventional cigarettes. So all of these contain nic nicotine, all these products. You have the nicotine inhaler, that is a pharmaceutical product, the e-cigarettes, the IQOS, uh, which is the most prevalent of the tobacco heating systems in conventional cigarettes. The temperature grows. The nicotine delivery can be really high with e-cigarette, but also lower. Um, but uh, you don't have you don't have polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons in e-cigarettes. You don't have tobacco-specific nitrosamines in e-cigarette, but you have volatile organic compounds. That means you still have an exposure to inhaling toxicants, uh, but you don't have the others who are really harmful. So the formaldehyde is class one. So there's no way we can remove formaldehyde from e-cigarettes, but we know they are less dangerous. And and um, it's it's a it's a call for those who think that still e-cigarettes are as dangerous as, as as tobacco cigarettes. Go back to the science and look at what's uh, coming out. If you find results that are as dangerous as cigarettes, then maybe maybe there's something that's 
not explainable by what we know, how these work and what comes out of it. And, and so to put that in perspective, you have one, the addictive potential of tobacco is really high and any e cigarettes the same and the risk for somatic health are lower just because what is going out of it. And I think in the debates, when I talk to people who are against e-cigarettes would say it's as dangerous as cigarettes, they usually probably mean that is as addictive as cigarettes and that they don't value addiction. So on the Y axis, I think we have a moral discourse around addiction and on the X axis, so in the somatic health, we have more health risks um, due to, to this. And, and I really uh, let you read this wonderful paper by Abrams et al, where we adapted this slide um, in Switzerland to communicate with the public and also with policymakers. Um, the other thing why I was so interested in cigarettes is that the situation, and I know there are a lot of economists here, so we did these, these paper looking at the price of nicotine. If you're a nicotine addict in Switzerland, you want to have a certain amount of nicotine in the blood, then you have the cigarettes, the tobacco heating systems, you have the SNUS, you have uh, nicotine replacement gums, patches, electronic nicotine uh, delivery systems and the closed systems. And we contrasted this price looking also at the GDP and the bioavailability because all these uh, devices don't deliver as much uh, in the body. You see that in Switzerland, in my, in my experience, nicotine replacement therapy is extremely expensive uh, and as expensive as cigarettes. And it's the same in Germany and the US, you are in another situation and France and UK are, are pretty different. So, so for underserved populations who don't have the money to go and buy nicotine replacement therapy who are not paid by the health insurance, e-cigarettes are available and especially a financially very interesting um, solution in Switzerland. So the background of the study, we have high certainty evidence that ants for smoke cessation are more effective for smoke cessation than nicotine replacement therapy. Um, there's limited evidence um, that they are more effective compared to usual care. Um, the, the intervention in most randomized trial was limited to one flavor, nicotine concentration, and we wanted to change this. But we also know that smokers who switch to electronic nicotine delivery system e-cigarettes after smoking tend to use them over a prolonged time. Um, and that's exactly the, the figure I told you, I showed you before. If, if you can substitute them well, why will they quit if they don't have as much health risk? And so that's the reason why they use them over a prolonged time. So the safety is actually what was, for me, where I was most interested in. Uh, for the efficacy, I think it's pretty clear and our results show that is, it goes in this direction that is effective, but the safety was important. And so what we did was data on severe adverse outcomes and adverse events, um, um, and we collected them a priori defi defined safety outcomes. We validated them through medical chart review. Uh, and actually the part where we're most proud of is the appendix of the paper, uh, which shows all uh, this work. Um, and another way we looked at it is to track antibiotics because uh, it's really hard to look at adverse events. Um, and uh, it's another way to estimate safety. But the further outcomes, we have many outcomes that we collected, but one that we published were the respiratory symptoms because it's a patient reported outcomes that is really related to tobacco smoking, cough and phlegm is really uh, to uh, expect to come from inhaled toxins from tobacco, cigarette smoke, especially phlegm. Um, so a reduction in these two would be a sign of improved lung health outcomes. And at six months, you don't have clinical outcomes, obviously with such a sample size. So it would be a signal that it goes in the right direction. The primary aims were to assess the efficacy and safety of free electronic nicotine delivery system in addition to standard of care compared with standard of care alone with respect to abstinence for tobacco smoking at six months. The secondary aim, this was predefined, but we didn't include it in the statistical analysis plan. Therefore, you won't find causal language in the New England paper. So to assess the effect of the intervention on respiratory symptoms. And the preparatory work was that the pharmaceutical industry has not invested in uh, e-cigarettes uh, and probably never will. 
uh, the only country that has a regulation that they should be regulated as medical devices is Japan, and there's only the tobacco heating systems there. Um, so we try to do a little bit what we would expect if a pharmaceutical company would come to us with this. So we worked with a company who had pharmaceutical grade cigarettes. We got a group of, um, 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 of vapors uh, helping us select a device and advise us about what are they doing. They told us you need to have a lot of different aromas. You need to have a lot of different uh, um, uh, e um, nicotine concentrations. Um, this device is good to entry, uh, so they advised us on what we should what we should do, and then we tested this in the lab to know you know how much exactly uh, is in in this in this e cigarette, and then we had a phase two um, where we had an exposition chamber to see can we mimic this what we find with with uh, with with cigarettes, and then the randomized trial. And what we do now is kind of a follow up cohort. Uh, as you know, we have a 12, 24, and 60 month uh, follow ups planned. The method was 12, 46 participants, randomized on a one to one ratio, five study sites in Switzerland, follow up at six months, and extension. Inclusion criteria just adults smoking five cigarettes a day and willing to quit smoking. And we excluded pregnant and planning preg uh, women um, playing pregnancy um, just because we you need dedicated trial um, uh, for them. Um, not that that would be uh, especially problematic e-cigarettes um, among them, but really because you need you need dedicated trial. Um, and uh, if they used ants and another smoke cessation during the last three months, um, but but we really didn't want to exclude anybody because they had um, uh, another uh, mental or somatic health condition. For example, we recruited among those who have a, um, a methadone program and heroin program in Switzerland uh, also to participate in this. Um, and now we, the, the point you need to get, the control group, it was how I would do it in clinics would I do the best work I can uh, with study nurses doing standard of care smoke cessation counseling? It was 30 minutes of counseling baseline after we consented participant and they, they filled out the questionnaire, then two months of phone, counsel, uh, phone counseling at week one, uh, at the target quit date, week one, week two, week four, week eight, and then we followed them up at six months. And that's recommending the guidelines that you should at least do intervention during two months. And they could use nicotine replacement therapy and other smoke cessation drug therapy. Um, but the nicotine replacement therapy, they had to buy themselves. And they received a 50 franc voucher uh, they could use at any purpose, including for the purchase of nicotine replacement therapy. The intervention group received the same, not the voucher, but they received free ants and a choice of e-liquids ad libitum. They could order as many as they want. And that's the board they had. We kind of were a little vape shop um, in, uh, in, the, in clinics. Uh, and so they had six aroma, two tobacco, three fruity, one menthol, uh, and four nicotine concentration, 0, 6, 12, 19.6. They could choose what they wanted. Also over time, reduce, increase, um, so that they really could choose what would most uh, help them. And the outcome, primary outcomes, six months sustained abstinence, um, uh, that's self-reported, no, no cigarette smoking target quit day by currently validated by urinary levels of less than three nanograms. And if anabazine was unavailable, validated by exhaled CEO. The secondary outcomes were sustain abstinence without um, validation or changing a little bit this definition and the same day, seven day point prevalence abstinence six months. Um, safety, serious adverse events, adverse events, antibiotics, and the respiratory symptoms. Yes, so I think we do a pause now. Thank you so much. You know I was so excited uh, when this trial came out. So first I'll hand over to Tracy for any questions or comments you might have at this point, and then I'll go to the Q&A. So please keep those questions coming. Um. Well, I just uh, agree with Jamie. I think this is a, a really exciting study. I think it's really strong and rigorous. I appreciate the attention to to good internal control. And um, also, I'm really sensitive to the comments that you made about a lack of data on 
toxic and exposure and health outcomes in the prior research and how important it is to really understand safety in the long term. Um, and I know that's not a small thing to have those outcomes in a trial like this. So um, very impressed with that. And I think that the data that comes out on 12, 24 and 60 months will um, be really informative for the field because we just don't quite have anything like that right now. Um, and I think that that, that will be important. Um, I'm curious if, um, you know, I think it was on a prior slide, your, the instructions that you are coaching that may have been given to the intervention group about how much to use the e-cigarette or if there was guidance provided about the um, nicotine concentration choice, if they were allowed to try those nicotine concentrations before picking one or the flavors before picking one. Um, and then in terms of like how often they should use it or, um, you know, instructions to, um, to ensure that they were getting enough um, that might be similar to what you would give in terms of dosing instructions to people who might use NRT or if there were different or if you guys left it more um, up to the participant. Yeah, so so we described this. Thank you so much for this question. And I think that the, the supplement that the paper and for those who don't have access again, go to the to the open access link. Um, uh, I, all at the end, we describe all the counseling we gave. Um, Basically, th these were nicotine salts, so uh, it was it, it it was irritating, and and so th when they tried, they could try different, and the nurse will say, "Look, uh, that's normal. You you feel it more in the throat. Uh, try to take as much as you can. Um, what you, what you can have, and in the beginning, um, uh, have enough uh, nicotine on board if you are the f feeling that you want to and smoke a cigarette, then take more uh, e-liquid, and that's for the beginning. And and for those who are highly uh, dependent, so meaning they were smoking forty cigarettes per day, uh, we recommended then to add um, nicotine enrichment therapy and not only stick to e-cigarettes because sometimes it's difficult. We're limited in Europe and Switzerland uh, to twenty milligrams per milliliter. That's not the case in the U.S., so it might be different. Uh, but that was something uh, we did. But for the other one, there was a lot of discussion between us and somebody said, one of the PIs said, hey, you really have to tell them that over time they should stop nicotine. And we said, well, I'm not sure because what we want to observe is what happens if uh, for us as clinicians, we start recommending these cigarettes and the reality is we are not a vape shop. So, so really to observe what people do over time without making stronger recommendation that they should stop nicotine over time and, uh, and, and see what's, what's going on. Because, and that's also not a traditional way of doing it. Maybe it's overblown with decision making and, and trying to, to, to have people fit their needs. Uh, they don't ask permission to smoke a cigarette with a physician. So why should they ask permission of how much they should use electronic cigarettes? So that was a little bit the, the gist of, of the intervention with, with recommendation. Everything is better than smoking cigarettes. To, we're there to, if you want to order 10 per week, then do that. We're not there to limit you. Thank you. Thank you. And we have two questions coming in on the Q&A. So the first one is why the control group didn't get given free NRT. It's an outstanding question. There's a, there's a, there's a regulatory question and then, um, and which is probably the most important. If you do nicotine replacement therapy in Switzerland, the Swiss medic stepping in. And that means amazingly intensive regulatory aspects of it where um where sometimes as ngo or not not pharmaceutical industry um sponsored trial it becomes really difficult to fund these kind of trials if you have these level of 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 supervision on it we tried to to mimic as we had them uh but we were not um um, um uh, we, we we didn't need to go to swiss medic the other one was the cost uh it would it's already a three million trial so it would have been a four to five million trial to give them nicotine replacement therapy so that was the the main reason why we didn't um give nicotine replacement therapy at the same time it was this trial showing uh 
contrasting nicotine replacement therapy compared to e-cigarette, there are already a lot. So, so for us in clinics, um, uh, in a context where nicotine replacement therapy is not paid, is much more for our context where we live in this world, uh, and uh, and uh, and that's reason why we didn't. The other question could be why did you offer them? <laughs> And why we did offer them, because toxicology was an important part. Um, so uh, maybe if we have time, I can show you the results on the toxicological part who were not published uh, in the New England paper. But uh, should we find a signal for safety, we wouldn't have known if it was because of e-cigarette they bought themselves or the cigarette uh, the cigarette we gave them. Uh, and that's the reason why we offered them. And the 50 francs um, voucher is about equivalent what it cost us to give them for free. Thank you so much. In the interest of time, I'm going to suggest that we move on now to hear your results. And if we have time to it, I'll come back to the next Q&A during the next Excellent. Session. Thanks so much. So there were uh, 2,000 participants were assessed for eligibility. They came from uh, the community. We advertised everywhere, even in buses, uh, to find them. Uh, um, they were uh, and 1246 underwent randomization. Um, 222 were sent to intervention group and 224 to the control group. Um, at 41 were lost to follow up and 38 uh, in the in the control group. Um, here, an important point: four withdrew and 29 withdrew in control group, which shows you also that some might have perceived this as a as an inferior arm and withdrew. One died in the control group. And then, of course, we did include all randomized in the analysis, except the one, I know, also the one who died. Yeah, sorry. We changed that over time. So um, the participant characteristics, which I would think is the kind of patient I see in clinics, um, mean age 39. Um, uh, women, we're happy that we have 47% uh, uh, of women. And just a note for person identifying as non-binary, uh, we had that question, but nobody identified as non-binary when we randomized them. Um, the employment, 74 were employed. Um, and for the education level, 7% um, uh, obligatory school versus 8%. Um, that might be a bit underrepresented in obligatory school and maybe overrepresented in tertiary education compared to Switzerland. It's about 35%, 30 in Switzerland for tertiary education. Age started smoking. I, I started at 13, so they started <laughs> at 16. Um, a number of cigarettes per day, 15. Uh, previous quit attempts, um, uh, the most had already a quit attempt. And the Fagerstrom test for dependence, for those who don't know that score, it's a, it's a, it's a score where we ask when you smoke your first cigarettes, um, how many cigarettes you smoke per day, and, um, and then the expired CO level, that's a carbon monoxide. At the beginning, we also had them exhale and see if they as positive for carbon monoxide, and that was 20, which shows they were smoking. So and another thing that this is um, in the, I think it's the appendix table uh, eight, uh, we chose how much really use these products. So first at baseline, we had the intention to use it. And and the, and the control group, 82% intended to use nicotine replacement therapy, 6% um, smoke cessation drug therapy versus um, so six and one. We didn't have the question about the intention because they were randomizing the intervention group. But at the, at start, uh, at the target quit date, which was one week um, uh, after we had those who reported using it, it was by phone, so it's self-reported, 93% uh, in the intervention group um, said that they were using a cigarette, 4% other nicotine replacement therapy, and in, in, the, um, in, the, in the control group, 50%. But at one week, it's really important to say, was that really inferior what they got in the control group? And um, it was about, if you add this up, it would be about 70 to 75% who had already, uh, who used at least for some time other nicotine replacement therapy or smoke cessation drug, and also recognize that uh, in the intervention group, they were also that were using nicotine replacement therapy. Uh, the follow-up rate is important if you want to interpret the results. So data on smoking status and SAE self-reported or by proxy was 89% versus 92%. Um, but why I show this is because of the seven-day point prevalence results, um, which I think is important for the field. 
Um, we had data on past seven day tobacco cigarettes. That's for table three that I will present later. Um, uh, it's 80 to 88%. But if you have data on anabazine and CO, if anabazine missing among participants reporting continuous smoking abstinence, you have 75% control group and 83% intervention group. Not all could come for the CO level in anabazine. It was also uh, some one or two years while during COVID, so they couldn't come back. We did that per phone. That's the reason why it's a bit lower. Um, but but the follow-up rates are not the same for the main outcome or for the seven-day point prevalence. And uh, that's where I will go now. It's the main outcome uh, uh, you, we, in the control group, um, the continuous abstinence validated by carbon monoxide, 16% versus uh, 29%, um, that's a crude relative risk of 1.77 and, and, um, and an absolute risk reduction of 12.7. And now if you look at 17 point prevalence absence without biochemical validation, you have a 32% versus 53%. But look at the crude relative risk. It's more conservative, 1.67. And, and I think that's an important caveat. You can do anabazine validation all this. If people don't come back, uh, you might have selective attrition who might also bias with results. Um, and uh, I'll let everybody decide which outcome they believe more. I, I do think there's some, some value in, in, in revisiting this mandate to validate abstinence, but we can discuss this. Um, and uh, table three, that's, I took it from the paper because it's such an awful table. <laughs> so I'll guide you through that. Now we have those who seven day point prevalence, we're not looking at validating and we know them who, who, who if they reported e-cigarette use. The central point is no tobacco cigarette was our main outcome. Tobacco abstainers, 38% versus 59%. That's a 20% increase in those who quit smoking. Now, you, when you look at exclusive e-cigarette users are non-smokers, but they use e-cigarettes. You have 3% control group, but 48%, and most were using it with nicotine. So with this, you can compute who were nicotine abstainers, meaning you're not using nicotine through smoking, through vaping, or through nicotine replacement therapy. You have 33% and 20%, that's a 13% less. Meaning you gain some who quit. And if smoking station is your main, out, main goal for smoking station, that's fine. But if your main goal is that people quit nicotine and tobacco, you have less. Meaning some would have quit and be nicotine free in the control group more than if they were in the intervention group. And some had quit smoking thanks to the e-cigarette because they were in intervention group. And that's, I think, the central elements we discuss between colleagues because some want to, for them, smoke cessation is quitting smoking and nicotine. And I'll say, no, it's only smoking. I don't care about the nicotine and the, the e risk of e-cigarettes are trivial. Safety, serious adverse events, 4% um, versus 5%. It's a risk ratio of 81. We're not powered for that, and we don't find significant difference. Adverse events, 34% uh, uh, um, reported uh, AEs and 36% in the control group. That's 1.19, and significantly it's in line with what Cochrane find. But interestingly, the antibiotics prescription, how many were were provided antibiotics during um, these six months, and it was 8.7% intervention group and, um, versus the control group, 1.26, again, non significant. Respiratory symptom, different in overall COPD assessment test score. Um, the CATS total score was five, that would be uh, right on the low side, but still there was uh, the difference in mean CAT score. Intervention resource control was minus 0.96, constant interval mi minus 1.52 to minus 0.41, and was mostly through differences in cough and phlegm. Limitation group allocation was unblinded. Control group received a voucher at baseline. 
sensitivity analysis testing effect of preferred group allocation baseline did not alternatively result. What I mean by that, but we asked them if you, in which group would you prefer being, and that didn't change the results. Um, um, but I already mentioned that the analysis based on self regulation were more conservative estimate. Um, and um, uh, be careful, it's not a contrast between ANDs and nicotine replacement therapy. It's a contrast between free ANDs added to smoke, um, a standard of care versus standard of care alone. Don't ask, extends to ask a question it was not meant to answer. Conclusion, the addition of free um, uh, e-cigarettes done in counseling was done greater abstinence from tobacco smokers than standard counseling, but many of those who abstain from tobacco uh, uh, continued using e-cigarettes. And uh, the intervention resulted in more adverse events, but not more serious adverse events. For us, and for me also as a clinician, and for standard of counseling may be a viable option for tobacco smokers who want to abstain from smoking without necessarily abstaining from nicotine, but may be less appropriate for those who want to abstain from both tobacco and nicotine. So I'll pause now. Thank you so much. So I'll hand over first to Tracy for any comments or questions you might have at this point. Um, sure, thank you. Um, well, I just really enjoyed that presentation and it's help it is helpful to have you walk us through some of those tables um, because they are in some ways kind of complicated. Um, so one thing that really caught my attention in the table that you pulled from the paper that shows what people were truly using um, is that if I understand the rose right, and I think I do, um, in the intervention group, people who completely switch, they're using e-cigarettes is 48.4%. That people who have completely quit, they're not using anything is 11.2% of those people. People who are just smoking, they're not using their e-cigarette at all is 22.1. And then the thing that caught my eye, I think is that 18.3% of people who are dual using. And the reason it caught my eye is because in a lot of the e-cigarette trials I've looked at, the rate of dual use is much higher. Um, in a trial that we did here at MUSC, um, that was a little bit, it was conducted not like a clinical treatment trial. It was a little bit more agnostic with, you know, less firm instructions to use. Um, we saw for us, dual use was the modal outcome. We were still really happy with the switching rates that we got, um, but dual use was the most common outcome. And so having only 18.3% of people who were dual using at the end and then having that really high switch rate of, of 48.4%, I was just curious kind of what you thought contributed um, contributed to that, to getting to more people kind of over the hump of dual use and towards complete e-cigarette use. Yeah. And so thank you so much for pointing to the dual users, which is probably where I think running a randomized trial is so important. As you know, our field is really has a problem with causal inference in some of our colleagues who say, oh, you know, I have my colleagues who say, oh, you're creating double users, dual users, and do they do worst? And I say, well, you know, a dual user is somebody who wants to quit and, and fail, right? Mm -hmm. and, and he cannot go away from it. Um, and so I, I don't, our results do not allow me to say why it is different in yours than, than in that, than in extents. Um, but, but I do think it's, there's a value of seeing, um, maybe we're looking at now at the predictors of quitting predictors of continuing using nicotine. And we could look into what are the predictors of, uh, dual use, uh, which might be associated with uh, psychiatric comorbidities and stuff like that, that, that you, you just can't quit. Um, I don't know if it doesn't answer your question. Um, the thing would be if you follow them over two months and each time you say, oh, you, you continue to smoke, hey, come on, I'll send you a couple of, uh, of e-liquids more to kind of try to avoid it and, and have an empathic approach of a person who are uh, still needing a cigarette because uh, they decided to quit. We know it, we have it rec on the record because they wanted to quit um, and, and still don't, and still find something in the cigarette, uh, in, this, in the traditional cigarette that fulfills their needs, so. Yeah, 
Um, I mean, it would be interesting to look at predictors of of kind of who falls into which bucket, as we sometimes call it, when we're looking at the data from our trial, like, you know, where they ended up. Um, some of the things that I kind of might, of course, you can't say, but hypothesize might have been helpful in this trial. Um, I do think probably the, you know, kind of clinical setting where it's added to standard of care, which we did not really do. The other thing is I really like what you said about, you know, you talk with vapors about which product to use and having a lot of the nicotine concentrations and a lot of the flavors. And, you know, I think a lot of the trials, not all, not all actually, but some of the trials that have, have done this before have really um, used one e-cigarette, for example, and that's what everybody gets. And so I wondered the degree to which that some of the variability in allowing people to find the right product for them um, may have been helpful, but I thought that was, a an interesting, um, an, an outcome to see, you know, good high switch rates. And, and I agree with you that, you know, there's a lot of talk about like creating dual users and, um, and they were all people who were smoking cigarettes at the beginning. So, you know, helping a large portion of them, I think is, is really important. The other thing that caught my, and then I'll, I know there's questions in the chat, so I'll ask one more question. Um, that caught my eye is I know y'all offered the zero milligram per mil, the nicotine free. And it does look like some of the people who are exclusive e-cigarette users at the end, about 9.1, it says 9.1% of them are using an e-cigarette without nicotine. And so I was wondering, um, you know, for the people who may, first of all, this is at six months. So whether or not there was transition to using an e-cigarette without nicotine over time or um, how the people who may have chosen that at the beginning, if you've looked at whether or not those people, um, whether or not their switch rates during the trial were different than the people who chose one that did have nicotine. Yeah, you can describe this. So your question is, about yeah. those those who changed then to change the concentration was it associated with uh, the quit rate uh, and I do think we dwell now in our our design does not allow us to answer this causally and as you know the exposure probably tracks most of the predictors uh, and that's that's the issue so we I have a slide where I can show uh, what they tend to use over time do you want me to do that um, if you if you're comfortable with it, I think that would be a, sure. Would yeah. Be so so we already pr presented this at SRNT and uh, and uh, we um, uh, Angela submitted this manuscript um, and um, so so that's the um, how we we look. So that's only the intervention group, uh, obviously, because the control group um, there were five percent used it somewhere else. But you see that basically the aromas didn't change that much over time. My intuition was they start with tobacco and then they go to something else. Not at all. I was in the room when there was somebody coming down from the mountains, a 60-year-old man said, I want, I want strawberry. <laughs> I was surprised. And so our results do not allow us to say, should you put aromas or not? You know, there's a hot debate on this. Um, uh, but our results don't. We just tested this. Um uh, but but if you look on the right side, the mean nicotine reconcentration most most reduced um, their nicotine content over time. So even there were vapors, uh, they were using less nicotine, and then we contrast dual users and uh, exclusive e-cigarette users. So I think that's just what I can say is that most then gradually reduced, um, and uh, and I think some will probably use nicotine all their lives. And and that's uh, until or when they and and uh, but most probably will quit and that's I think the main interest of the twelve and twenty four month and five month five years uh, uh, follow up to see how do they transition and also how do they transition to other 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 use pouches iquas and other things. Yeah, thank you. I think this slide is really cool on the right, and I. Um... I, I sometimes you see in surveys among people who are trying to quit vaping, when you ask them, you know, how are you trying to quit? People will say, I'm reducing my nicotine concentration. Um, and I've always wondered, and you have the ability to look at this, if the there would be reductions in um, total nicotine equivalents or coatening with that, or whether or not people might titrate their nicotine intake as they lower nicotine concentrations and they're not 
really exposed to less nicotine. They're just reducing the nicotine concentration, but using it more. Um, and so maybe that, you know, is something that you guys could look at as you dig Yeah, we, we did look at the urine too, because we have the urine of these people and there is a, re a reduction in nicotine exposure. Yeah. As people do that? Okay, cool. That's really interesting. Okay, I'll turn it back over to Jamie to moderate some questions. Thanks so much to both of you. Now, Redo, I want to, I know you have a few more slides that you could share, and we also have a lot of questions in the Q&A. So I want to check with you how many questions from the Q&A you'd like me to ask at this point. No, I love questions. Okay, great. I'll throw a few your way. So first one, um, what, can you comment on what types of adverse events and serious adverse events you observed in the trial? Excellent question, and and I think the the appendix um, of the of the paper presents. I think we have um, we have three pages of adverse events uh, that we collected. So we collected all over the place because tobacco destroys everything in your body, and his cigarettes too. So we're trying to look at adverse events with something that is really harmful and trying to see what would be the harm of e-cigarette per se, but basically for a background of something that is really dangerous. So actually it's basically probably more what happens when people quit, right? Um, so it's there's always this conundrum when you look at, at these. So we looked at cardiovascular outcomes, respiratory outcomes and cancer risk and uh, other broken bones. So the definition of serious adverse events was if somebody was um, was hospitalized for more than 24 hours or died or had a serious condition, that's defined. And for the adverse events, what we report here, it's each time the person saw a physician for a problem and that we asked for all the documentation and uh, there's a whole range of it. We tried to find a pattern or something that would be going down. The 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 the, the numbers are so low that you can't um, we can't find anything. Um, so we we didn't see a pattern for anything. Maybe if I can comment, it was during COVID. The only signal we found, and I think we had one sentence in the paper on it, was about um, symptomatic COVID. Um, but it wasn't, uh, we didn't have enough event if there were more people that ended up in the ICU for COVID, um, which um, needs to be interpreted with caution. We don't know if they reported it more, they went more to the physician, were more health conscious. It shouldn't be that because it's a randomized trial, but it's definitely an interesting finding about this. I think it's one of the only, maybe other in the room uh, saw another pattern, but that's really the importance of, of collecting this seriously because Extens was not meant to answer that completely, but that's typically the kind of data that needs to be pulled um, without a trial and that, and encourage all the researchers to do that fully because that's exactly the kind of signals we need to understand um, of the unexpected consequences everybody's talking about but we still haven't seen any cigarettes. Interesting. So just to clarify, you saw higher rates of ICU admission in the people randomized to the intervention than the control No, we, we saw a, a, a higher rate of symptomatic COVID okay. that went to a physician in the okay. intervention group. Interesting. But there wasn't more that were hospitalized for COVID. Okay. That's really interesting. Thank you. Um, we have a question as well, or comment, um, that it seems like it would be useful to monitor what happens after the trial to observe what the intervention would group when group would do when they have free will out in the real environment. Could you then help plan a practical way to help those who stop smoking but remain using e-cigarettes to quit all nicotine? For example, maybe reducing nicotine dose. Excellent. So initially, what we wanted to do is kind of a flip trial. You know, when when you have, if you were in the control group after six months, my intention was to provide them with the cigarettes and then see if they also then stop smoking. The ethic commission said we can't do that because the safety is not yet assessed, uh, which was wonderful because then we could continue. So we don't want to intervene on this population uh, because the value of extents now is having this cohort where you see what happens if during six months you gave something and then you observe what's going on. 
um, and uh, and and we dream each day of saying, okay, now we will offer them citizen or we will do that, but we try not to intervene in this population. And uh, we hope others will do these kind of things and, and recognize that smoking is a chronic condition. There's no one intervention that will work for everybody. And that, that in alcohol uh, disorder, they do these kind of smart design where if you fail in one, then you start with another one. And then if you fail, then you start with another one. And I think that's really important for a chronic condition like smoking where um, uh, over time you need probably other interventions too. Thank you. And we've had a couple of similar comments come in around the context, essentially, and I mean that at a country level. So one comment, for example, says in the US, these products are not regulated as they are in other countries and they're manufactured by tobacco companies that have profited off production and marketing of their intentionally addictive products. Can you comment on the ethical dilemma that this might present in the US? Or do you think that, you know, the EU and the UK having stricter policies, as another person have commented, might change the context of your trial than if you were to conduct it here in the US? So I'm fully with you. And that's what I meant with hate the smoke, love the smokers. You know, there's a, it's, there needs to be regulation, strong regulation, so that we're not bombarded with advertisement for these. Um, it's not always available. These are regulated products. Um, and there's also a need for a new discourse around making money, you know, selling tobacco, which kills every second one, is is certainly not a good business, but selling nicotine, if we allow that the pharmaceutical industry does produce nicotine and sell nicotine, um, then I think we need to be more uh, prudent about uh, if we're working with the devil or not. I think there are many industries that would feel attacked if we, if, if we say this. So that's what we kind of tried. We kind of tried to evaluate one e-cigarette with a producer that was independent from tobacco companies and then test it ourselves. And we hope that other jurisdictions will do the same and trying to provide um, uh, clinicians and the general population with first information of what it is, regulated products, and hopefully another industry as a tobacco industry will enter the market and that's uh, dependent on the regulation in each country and in Europe and the UK the market is really different than in in, in the US um, there is a lot of independent vape in 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 Europe which is not the, the the less so in in the US so the ethical dilemma is there I do think also that the question is not about the if but the how and why and what exactly um but but that each and everybody looks also at the moral aspect of the place of addiction in society and and do we accept that some will continue using nicotine uh a decent proportion will continue to use nicotine or do we want a, a world without nicotine or without tobacco the, uh, the angle we took in extends because it was in Clinex, because we're clinician is out of tobacco and not necessarily nicotine, but on the public health perspective and global perspective, people certainly can see that differently. And that's a democratic debate and not a scientific debate. Thank you so much. So I am going to hand over to you to show us a couple more slides if you'd like to. Um, Oh, cool. Yeah. yeah that's okay. So this slide, you already saw it. Um, and now we're going into toxicology, which is really, uh, you know, we had one PhD student in extents, and it was a chemist. <laughs> and for me as a primary care doc, I learned so much from, from him and from Aurelie. So um, what we want to know is, is, you know, if, if you, if you switch to e-cigarettes and you don't smoke, versus you switch to e-cigarette, uh, you, you don't smoke and don't use e-cigarettes, can you detect the difference in the urine? And we wanted, so we had 30, uh, 306 uh, consecutive participants at baseline and six month follow-up. We had a lot of missing because of COVID. Um, so these are analysis we are, uh, it's a manuscript in preparation. But if you contrast the control intervention group 
and you look at nicotine equivalents, and that's nicotine metabolites. So that comes from e-cigarettes and also from tobacco. You see no difference between the two. Anabazine, which is really stemming from tobacco, um, there was a difference in anabazine. Um, there were less in the bench group, obviously, because many stopped smoking. And then the AMA, it's a, volat uh, it's a polycyclic aromatic um, uh, hydrocarbon. You had um, uh, less in the prevention group, fairly significant, and the VOCs uh, a bit less. And I'll move now to the poor exposure analysis. So these were by randomized group. So here you have the NS are the non-smokers, the ANS users are those who are using ANS and not smoking, the dual users are the dual users, uh, and these are the smokers. So nicotine metabolites, about those obviously have nicotine because they're using ANS, but here if you look at the anabazine, you don't have anabazine in the e-cigarettes we gave them, uh, and so these were similar um, than uh, in non-smokers, but the dual users and the smokers uh, had more anabazine. And uh, pH, the um, one naphthol, that's a basically hydrocarbon, uh, you have less in both. And for the VOCs, you have both. The main limitation of this is we're still not capable of measuring in the urine formaldehyde. And remember, this is the thing that is problematic in, in these cigarettes. So that's one thing our field needs to work on is, is really have a good measure of formaldehyde. If somebody has one and has funding, we all have all the urine the aliquots, and it would be really interesting in knowing if the exposure to formaldehyde would be higher in ends um, because we have a background exposure to formaldehyde. Um, and that would be really interesting to contrast. So with this limitation, we kind of show that Yes, when you use ANS, you cannot differentiate if you quit and not expect, for, except for nicotine. We had about 20 of difference of these compounds we measured. But the other additional ongoing analysis, our goal was to prepare the next generation. So about 10 uh, dissertation students working on this and, 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 and postdocs and, and doctors um, and, and other colleagues. Impression the anxiety, we didn't find any difference. The sleep, we didn't find any big difference maybe for those who are really not sleeping well, that they uh, improve their sleep in the intervention group, the weight didn't change, blood pressure, no difference. Olfactory function improved, uh, physical activity, we didn't analyze it. If you're interested, call me. Uh, and um, we also have in a subset of participants, we tested micronuclei in mouth epithelium, inflammatory biomarkers in blood, lung function, lung MRI, uh, but we haven't uh, analyzed uh, them yet. We're, we're working on it. And then we have the follow-up at 12, 24, and 16 months. Um, so the outlook, um, we really think extends the main result out to be integrated in a large body of evidence of efficacy safety of endless mobilization. Um, we're working on 12, 24, and 16 month visit are starting now. Um, and don't hesitate to contact us for further collaborations. Our data is open access. Um, so if um, uh, one, the, the, the data that is published and is open access and you can ask because it's uh, pseudo anonymized, we'll ask you to fulfill a certain amount of criteria for uh, confidentiality. Um, but um, our funder uh, is supporting these open access in retail. Wonderful. Thank you so much. For anyone with a question in the q and I didn't get to my apologies, but those will be shared with Reto. And I will now pass over to our MC to close us out. We are out of time. However, if you still have burning questions or thoughts for Dr. Auer, you can join us for Top of the Tops, an interactive group discussion offered immediately following select Tops events this season. To join, please copy the Zoom meeting room URL posted in the chat and switch rooms with us once this event concludes. We'll leave this webinar room open for an extra minute after the end to give everyone a chance to copy the URL, which is bit.ly slash tops meeting, all lowercase. Thank you to our presenter, moderator, and discussant. Finally, thank you to the audience of 142 people for your participation. Have a top snatch weekend.